So how do you explain that? Well, let's think very simply. We either have to give up entirely the conservation of energy law because we now have creation of energy by the source charge and source dipole. Which means you're violating Humboldt's law of 1848. That's right. We either have to give up the conservation of energy law, which would be, you know, would be a thing to be, do very reluctantly because there's so much proof of it in other things, so wide a variety of proofs. Or we have to say there's an input of energy that's not observable, that somehow is being changed into observable energy and poured out in three space. Then we say, well, where is this energy coming in from? We can prove it's not coming in in three space. Well, there's only one thing left if I'm working in Minkowski space, four dimensions. It's coming in the time domain over in that fourth axis. The only variable there is time. So I'm having energy flow in in the time domain. We find a solution because we look at the nature of spin. Spin is not just turning around like a ball or a top or something. It's a much more complicated concept. But if I sort of think of it as spin, it's sort of like the spin spins 360 degrees over in the complex plane, then spins 360 degrees in three space, real space. Well, while it's over spinning in the uh, 360 over in the time domain, it can absorb energy coming in in the fourth axis because the charge is looking over there and it's open to the receipt of energy from that domain. Then when it starts to rotate, or so to speak, in, in three dimensions over in real space, it's already excited by this time energy, the energy it received in the time domain. So it is decaying now. It is putting out the energy, emitting the energy. It absorbs in the time domain, emits in the uh, three space. In fact, it emits longitudinal waves. Now, I can find very powerful support for that in uh, two other areas. One is uh, particle physics and one is quantum field theory. In quantum field theory, for example, <clears throat> Mandel and Shaw in their standard uh, textbook, uh, quantum field theory, Wiley, 1984, Chapter 5, they very strongly look at a very similar problem. They look at the longitudinal photon and the scalar photon, which is a time polarized photon. The energy is over there oscillating on the time axis. Okay, so what we have is we have a very strong argument <clears throat> that neither the scalar photon, that is the time polarized photon, nor the longitudinal photon, which is over in three space, are individually observable. But if you somehow can combine the two, they are observable as the instantaneous quantum potential. Nice, because if I go back to uh, Whitaker 1903 as decomposition of the scalar potential in the bidirectional longitudinal waves, Whitaker made an error in his, uh, in his uh, interpretation. It's a standard area made throughout most of U1 electrodynamics. They interpret the wave after it's interacted with the charge, in other words, what's diverted from the wave by the charge. They don't ever specify the wave in space or the photon in space or the energy in space. They always do the thing after it interacts. Now, if you go back before it interacts, you had to have something causing this interaction. That's in the fourth space because you get three space after you have observation. You have a partial with respect to T to tear off the time and leave your frozen snapshot, and that's what you see, the effect. Anyway, they argue very powerfully that this combination of these two give you the instantaneous uh, quantum potential. And if I reinterpret Whitaker's decomposition to straighten out the fact that he had two effects rather than a cause and effect, his input phase conjugate wave actually is a time polarized wave, which means it now agrees with the same thing from quantum field theory, from, uh, excuse me, particle physics. Uh, and, and, and quantum field theory. Now, in particle physics, we have the fact that with the award of the Nobel Prize, any dipole is known to have uh, to be a broken symmetry in the active exchange with the vacuum. The very definition of broken symmetry means that some conservation law there in that exchange area has been violated. That's what broken symmetry means. So what it means is if I have energy coming in in the time domain, it means that it's not flowing back out in the time domain, and it's flowing out in the uh, space, free space domain, and that uh, is exactly what's happening over in the other ways of looking at it. So we have an agreement between quantum field theory, between my interpretation of uh, reinterpretation, I should say reinterpretation of Whitaker's profound decomposition of the scalar potential in 1903, and... Uh, quantum field theory. We have an agreement between three major things. So that's pretty solid. So we can state now that all EM energy in three space first enters there on these source charges. It first enters there from the time domain. Basically, 
any three space EM energy we're looking at, we have converted a little time into that. Now, how powerful is time energy? Let me give you a little experiment to think of in your head, a little thought experiment. Suppose uh, that I have a, I have some spatial energy, electromagnetic energy in space. And suppose I reach in here and I compress this by the factor C squared. I'm in three dimensions now. I've compressed this down to a very dense energy in three dimensions. What can I do with this? Well, I can leave it right where it is, in which case it's known as mass. That's E equal MC squared, standard thing, familiar to everybody, no big problem. Everybody can get their mind a hold of that. But I don't have to leave it in three dimensions. If I pick this thing up and I put it over in a time domain, what I've really done is change the photon oscillations from, uh, from uh, uh, lateral in three space to lateral over there along the time axis. So I have a longitudinal wave in a time domain, and it becomes what we call time. So time itself is pure energy, and it, in fact, has the same energy density as mass. It's very powerful energy. If you want to deal with powerful energy in the photon, you don't deal with the spatial energy component, delta E. You deal with delta T because you've got to multiply it by C squared to find out how much spatial energy has been compressed into it. So the highest energy photon in the world are not the low-frequency photons, but the, I mean the high-frequency photons, but are the low-frequency photons. They have less spatial energy, but the amount of time goes up as exactly by the amount that you decrease the spatial energy, and you multiply that by C squared. So by having the spatial energy, you go up to 2C squared times uh, the amount of energy you got compressed over there in the time. You've got a lot more energy gained in a, in a low-frequency photon, but carried as time. And so that's really the reason that Tesla was always playing around with low, lower frequencies. A lot more energy. The real high energy physics is in converting the time into energy, which is always done to the source charge anyway. Just use that process nature has given us, which is a negentropic process. It's an open system far from equilibrium. It's not your classical equilibrium thermodynamic system. You've got to go to the thermodynamics, like, for example, uh, the, of the kind that Prigogine was given the Nobel Prize for contributions to in 1977. Any open system far from equilibrium with an active environment, is capable of doing five magic functions the U1 model prohibits. It is capable of self-ordering. The order comes out of nowhere. Don't worry about it. The system does it itself. It's capable of um, self-oscillation or self-rotation. Don't worry about it. All the, ener you know, the energy is coming from the external environment, and it can oscillate back and forth, coming in and out. It can also output more energy than you have to put in there. It can also output less energy than you have to put in there, than you do put in there. The other thing it can do, it can you don't have to put anything in. It can power itself in a load. I've been working on this from a power viewpoint. Uh, if you go curve the space-time the other way, it'll take energy out and put it back into the time domain. You'll get time uh, increase in the amount of time, but you'll also get uh, you'll get cooling energy. You'll get negative energy instead of Positive energy. All that is, is instead of the energy being uh, divergent, it's convergent. And it's perfectly uh, good solutions when you've got convergent energy versus divergent. One is cooling, one is heating. You don't have to have heating when you've got energy. If you open up the model. Now, if you go to U1, you're, you're playing with fire because you're just not going to get it that way. Uh, and if you use classical equilibrium thermodynamics, you can never tell, you can never use that to determine how a non-equilibrium system is operating. First of all, it's already at higher energy, it's already at an excited state, it's not at equilibrium. So that thermodynamics doesn't fit. You don't have to worry about the second law, that belongs to the old thermodynamics. You have broken the second law because...